Hello, everyone. Uh, in today's session, we're going to talk about data lake house architectures, uh, specifically how to get data warehouse performance on the data lake house. We're also going to talk about how fast performance doesn't just mean like uh, faster queries, you know, low latency, but it also means um, easier data governance and more simplified data pipeline, right? Uh, and now let's get started. So first, let's talk about data lake houses. So we've been building data warehouse-like features such as schema evolution, compaction, near real-time ingest uh, on open and standardized storage, open and standardized file formats such as Delta Lake, Apache Iceberg, Apache Hoodie, and open file formats such as Parquet Files with you know open catalog service access. Um, so why are we doing that? Because as opposed to something that's open and standardized, um, you're using, let's say you're using a proprietary data warehouse with your data in the format that's enforced by the proprietary data warehouse. The amount of workload you can run on that data that's in proprietary format is limited by the data warehouse itself, right? It's probably there, you know, a few connectors here and there, but it's not enough for you to run all of your applications or your workloads. Right. But opposed to if you store everything in the open and standardized format, now we have a chance to unify most of our workloads, at least near real time and batch workloads on a single source of truth data. And this has enormous uh, benefits of doing something like this. So first you have easy data governance because you're not managing multiple copies of the same data that's scattered around into 15 different systems. And also it simplifies your architecture because storage is stateful, it's big, it's expensive. And managing only one storage is really good you know, for your architecture. And also you have the flexibility of having one piece of the data and multiple compute and applications that are running on top. Those are stateless in terms of they don't persist, in, persist any data. So you can swap them in and out with no trouble. And overall, this is a very more cost-effective uh, solution when compared to a proprietary data warehouse. So this is great, right? Data lake house is great. People must be doing that, right? One piece of data unify everything on there. But the reality is no, at least not yet. Users are still forced to copy their data out of the lake house because existing data lake query engines are just not fast enough. They're either not optimized for high concurrency, low latency workloads, or they're not, they're still on older technologies. They're not really taking advantage of all of the crazy optimizations we're doing to you know, query engines today in 2024. Not being able to handle those workloads, basically, the user has two options. Either they over-engineer or overspend on existing query engines to you know, to barely get passable performance. And that's not really sustainable or it's not really future-proof. So as a workaround, uh, users are all often still forced to move their workloads and copy their data to a high-performance data warehouse purely for query acceleration reasons. Um, this does solve the performance issue, but it brings a whole new set of challenges. So first, you have to consider the cost of actually maintaining a data warehouse itself infrastructure level, stateful, big, use a lot of compute, error prone. And it's very labor intensive as well as just expensive to maintain, right? And also you have to consider the cost of the actual data ingestion pipeline, which thousands of them, and the process of you know writing your data from one format, file format to another. And this is a very expensive and error prone process, very expensive to maintain. Also, you have to consider the challenge of designing a whole new set of schema, index design, and also matching the data type SQL between your data warehouse and data lake layer. And that's not something we want to do. And most importantly, you're copying your data out of the data lake. There is no more single source of truth on your data lake. And this is really challenging for data governance. And it actually breaks the fundamental promise of data lake house system, data lake house architectures. So why are fast queries challenging on data lake? So what's, what, what is going wrong? So first on the highest level, query engines that are used for lake house today were not built for 
data warehouse like workloads. Some of them are they're optimized for, for, for performance, but they're more optimized for long running batch workloads, you know, those ETL workloads that runs for hours or even days, right? Not low latency, high concurrency data warehouse like you know, customer facing like workloads. Or they're built for a complete different purpose. You know, some of them are built, you know, to optimize for connecting to a lot of data sources, building great connectors, but not really optimized for query performance 100%. And on the technical side, the process of fetching data and metadata can easily become the bottleneck. So first you have to consider the IO cost, you know, actually fetching terabytes of scanned data from your data lake you know, to the query engine itself. It used a lot of IO. It actually slowed down the query execution process as well, right? Because it, it can slow down the shuffle process, which, you know, modern query engine use, you know, to solve um, aggregation and join uh, queries. And also you have to consider the slow and predictable performance of data lake storage devices. You know, typically run, if it's on the cloud, runs on the cloud object storage where the response time latency can be upward to 100 milliseconds, which is really not acceptable for low latency queries, especially random scans. And also you have to consider data files, metadata and data files can be unoptimized for query performance. Let's say for example, if there's too many small data files and this is horrible for data scanning, right? That's something we have to solve. So how to accelerate daily query performance? So what are the features that optimization you should look for? You know, if that's what, what, what you want, what you want to do. So first, a hierarchical caching framework is absolutely necessary. And this is to overcome the unstable performance of data lakes, right? We just talked about, and also to save IO calls, to minimize IO calls from you know, fetching data from external data lake storages. Also, you want to find a query engine that can do MPP, that is MPP, Massively Parallel Processing, so scalable, and is able to do in-memory data shuffling. So instead of you know, persisting every shuffle to disk, you want something that can you know, shuffle between memories and ideally run the entire query process uh, completely in memory to be optimized for low latency instead of batch workloads. Also system, system level optimizations, you wanna find a query engine that is written in a lower level language, such as C++, to fully utilize CMD instruction sets. That basically is you know, multiple data points, uh, process multiple data points for each CPU cycle, and batch operation is always good for OLAP, and this is absolutely necessary if you wanna get the best performance. Actually with the right tools, getting data warehouse performance on a data lake house is not only possible, it's actually quite easy to do. And we're gonna show some numbers just in a little bit. So here we're gonna use Staros as the example, uh, query engine uh, for the benchmark test we're gonna show between data warehouse and data lake house. Uh, we're gonna tell you why uh, we pick Starox uh, in the next slide. But here let's first begin with a short introduction of Starox. It is a Linux Foundation open source Apache licensed uh, lake house query engine, right? as all of the things we talked about, MPP architecture is C++ CMD optimized, and it's able to run um, sub-second query latency with really high concurrency. So ba basically all of the data warehouse workloads, you know, you can run with on a data lake. The reason why we pick Staros as an example is because it can operate two ways. It has its own file and table format, its own storage, and you can ingest into Staros and use it as a data warehouse on the left. Do real-time analytics, right? You can ingest using um, the Staros storage engine and get sub 10 second data freshness, you know, with mutable data directly on its columnar storage, right? As a data warehouse, or you can swap out the Staros storage engine and use a open table format, open file format, basically a data lake house as your storage and query that data lake house directly, you know, as a lake house query engine for Staros. Two type of deployments, and now let's compare the two. Before we actually compare the two performance, let's get a baseline. Staros is an incredibly performant data warehouse by itself, right? Here is an SSB benchmark test between a few very highly performant data warehouses. So everything with a multi-table, 
it's a it's the original uh SSB multi-table, uh multi-table test, originally a multi-table test. And everything in the flat is a alternative uh test that is basically denormalized uh all of the uh, multi-table into a big flat table and basically only do on the fly aggregation but not on the fly join right and we can see here that Sarah's single table performance is faster than ClickHouse way faster than Druid and the thing here is Sarah's multi-table performance is actually faster than Apache Druid single table performance almost as fast as ClickHouse single table performance it says a lot because join is probably one of the most expensive thing you can do you know uh, with a SQL script, a SQL query script. And Starbucks is incredibly fast as a data warehouse. So how does it do the, the two compare? Data warehouse versus lake house. Um, hot queries, same exact hardware with TBCD as one terabyte benchmark test. The data warehouse solution is only 12% faster. Just think about it here. For only 12% of the performance loss, what do we get? Now we have a chance to unify all of our workloads on a single source of truth data. No data copying, uh, way better data governance, better flexibility, right? And overall very more cost-effective. And this is actually available today. And this is really, really impressive. So how does a purposely built Lakehouse query engine compare to other query engines? Uh, here we're gonna use Trino as a comparison. Trino was a game changer for the data lakes. It has an MPP architecture, run everything in memory, it has the option to run everything in memory. It was way faster than MacReduce that it re reduced the latency from hours to minutes, right? A massive amount of data. But back then we didn't really have a lake house architecture, right? We didn't have like, like a unified storage that we can that can do transactions, that can do schema evolution, that can do SQL really well, right? So the ask from user back then was to connect to all of the data sources and do analytics in place. So Trino did exactly that. It's written in Java to be optimized to, to, to develop great connectors really fast, right? Uh, but it is really not that optimized for high performance. It's only against a few data lake houses. And here, let's do a comparison between the two. Um, this is a TBCDS one terabyte benchmark test. Starox is 4.6 times faster than Trino you know, on TBCDS one terabyte. And this is even with Trino on JDK21, it's supposing getting that uh, auto CMD boost you know, from the JDK update. So there's a big difference. So this sounds good. Might not, might, this might sound good in theory, right? So how does it work in real life, in actual production systems? So what are the tech leaders uh, doing? So now uh, let's welcome Eric Sun uh, from Coinbase, one of a dear friend of mine, um, to the stage and talk about data lake with open formats. You know, he's going to talk about real-time analytics, Unity Catalog, um, Delta Lake, and multiple query edges. Uh, now let's welcome Ericsson uh, to the stage. Who can move? Okay. Uh, so in this, in, in the next uh, slides, we're going to uh, show you an architecture with really uh, open data lake uh, combined with Unity Catalog and a multiple query engine not only Star Rocks. And in this one, it reflects how we use all these uh, great query engines with open you know, storage la uh, layer together to achieve both the performance and the cost effect e effectiveness. All right, next one. All right, so let me walk you through a little uh, about the different component in this architecture diagram. On the, on the left side, we have the MPP um, database, which is a star rocks, and there's a two piece of it. Um, in the center, we have Unity Catalog with the Delta Lake sitting on it with un uniform uh, supporting multiple 
uh, open file format. On the right side, we have uh, Puppy Graph and uh, DuckDB. They are uh, different uh, query engines uh, for different purpose. Uh, why we put this together? So let me start with uh, the Starrox data warehouse component first. This is uh, the one that we load uh, all our uh, crypto on-chain transaction history data in real time into it. And then we also load some of our uh, trading transaction data into it, uh, leveraging the super fast ingestion engine paired with the data warehouse uh, architecture provided by Starrox, for for example, hash partition, primary key, uh, bitmap index, and also the materialized view. And in this case, we mainly focus on the very low latency and uh, high concurrent, you know, ad hoc queries about those data. But the the, our customers love this, you know, query responsiveness and the low latency OLAP capability, but they also want to occasionally access the history data. And since this is, a, if we only use the uh, warehouse mo mode, then that means we need to store uh, terabytes of the data with three copies uh, in the Snowflake, uh, sorry, in the Starrock. And uh, we want to find a right balance here. That's why we offload the historical data into the Delta Lake, which was managed by Databricks. And we have all the data produced there already. And with the help of a Unity catalog, and we can let Star Rocks to query and, and uh, map all this table and the partition name to the right location of S3. So that is what we call the integration between Starrox and the Unity catalog. For the first version, we call V0. And this will uh, support uh, mainly the authentication provided by Unity catalog. And we will take care of the uh, access control through the IAM row uh, in S3 so that uh, we will mostly treat the data on S3 uh, as you know, uh, another hive uh, a directory. But with the announce of Open Catalog API today in Databricks, and the next phase of the integration will also include the authorization part uh, from Unity Catalog. What that means, uh, Star Rocks will also respect the uh, pre-signed S3 or GCS URL uh, to access the underlying S3 system without uh, the need of a pre uh, codify the you know I am row access in this way, and we're truly using the Unity catalog as the universal or federated catalog to uh, manage all the data. And in addition to that, we do expect in the next version of Unity catalog integration, Starrox will further be able to you know uh, perform a write operation uh, to the Delta Lake. Uh, through the Unity catalog. And we do expect that we will start to roll out other connectors uh, to use Unity catalog to access Delta Lake. Here, we want to give you two examples. And uh, Puppy Graph is a very interesting graph uh, query engine. It doesn't require us to load or ETL any of the data into a, a specialized or proprietary uh, database storage layer for graph, they can just simply query everything on your data lake. Doesn't matter it's Delta or Iceberg or just pure Parquet file. And they can pull the data into the graph model and in another distributed computation engine and render all the results for you. And we just use this one to to, to couple this with Unity Catalog so that we open up all our transactional and crypto data, uh, which are already, already on our Delta Lake, then Puppy Graph can query them directly and uh, perform all kinds of uh, you know, graph-based exploration and aggregation. This is so powerful and our user really enjoy this type of a flexibility. And then uh, another one 
uh, it's already mentioned by uh, Databricks announcement earlier, is DuckDB can also access Delta Lake through the Unity catalog integration already. And uh, we also see a lot of a data profiling and the data mart kind of use case uh, can really benefit this kind of embedded database that we put DuckDB inside of one of the service. And then this service can suddenly have some, you know, a data exploration capability and we can build an awesome data application on top of the UI. So when you look at this diagram, you, you notice that th this is a truly a uh, heterogeneous you know, uh, combination that uh, we can leverage uh, the foundation of Delta Lake and also Unity Catalog, but also allow multiple query engines to harvest and uh, leverage the data sitting in this solid foundation. And we are trying to do using the best query engine for the right job. And we are not limiting ourselves to a single technology. And this opens up a lot of opportunities for us to combine both the uh, single source of truth, but also the flexibility and, effic and efficiency of data application and the data processing. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn back to Sid and we will probably uh, get some questions answered. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, I love that. Uh, data Lake House is all about easier data governance, openness, you know, the ability to choose between different applications and compute engines. I love that. Um, thank you guys for joining. Uh, you can sign up for Celeda Cloud and claim your 30-day free trial today, or you can join the Staros community channel. You can use this link or the QR code below. Thank you guys again for joining. Um, see you guys again next time.